Welcome to the podcast of New Story Church in downtown Los Angeles. We pray that this message inspires you to be the church wherever you are. For more information about our community of faith, check out newstorychurch.com. We hope you'll enjoy the message. And what's up, New Story fam? It is so good to worship God with you today. My name is Dustin and I serve as the college and young adult pastor. And just because some of you might be wondering, I am sitting because I injured my ankle playing basketball. So for this week and probably next, you'll have a sitting pastor preaching the word to you. But even though the person sharing the word with you uh, may be falling apart, God's word is still and always will be Good. And so I am so excited that I get to share with you today. And today we're talking about something that we all should think about, but most of us actually seldom do. And this is the topic of legacy. And so if you're worshiping with someone right now, would you look at them and would you say legacy? If you're on YouTube in the chat section, um, then would you type in that word legacy? Because legacy is what we are talking about today. And before we jump into this message, I just want to come before the Lord in prayer. So would you guys bow your heads with me? Let's come before our God. Father, we want to thank you so much for this Sunday. Lord, a day of rest where we can come before you and hear from your word. Uh, Lord, to remember the purpose of our lives and, Lord, what you've called us to. God, we invite your spirit to move right now. Lord, that our hearts would be open to you and, and, Lord, that you would do that inner transformative work that only you can do. Lord, we pray that during this time, um, Lord, that you would speak so clearly through your word, Lord, and that lives would be transformed by your power. So, Father, we thank you for today. We praise your name. And in Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Amen. So I remember about a month or, a month ago or so, I was on a Zoom call with a group of young Christian leaders from around the world, and one of the speakers challenged us with a question along the lines of, what legacy will you leave? And he was asking us what we wanted to be true 30 years from now and what kinds of impact we hope to have on this world. And he encouraged us to study, to write, to create content and influence culture. And perhaps this is something that we need to ask ourselves today. And you see, one's legacy can be defined as one's life impact. The way in which one shapes the people around him or her. And throughout scripture, you see this theme of legacy all throughout. I mean, Adam and Eve, they left a legacy of sin. Cain, a a legacy of jealousy and violence. The Israelites, a legacy of disobedience. Paul, a legacy of disciple making. And Jesus, a legacy of grace. And I really believe that today's text has so much to say about this theme, which I look forward to sharing with you all. So if this is your first time joining us, we are in a sermon series titled, Prophecy for a New Day, where we are teaching through the books of the Old Testament minor prophets. And they're called minor because the books themselves are shorter and not because they aren't significant. And these go from Hosea until Malachi. Now, Pastor Tom actually preached through Haggai in the first three weeks. And today we're jumping into another very important and yet minor prophetic book called Zechariah. Now, Zechariah is a prophet and a priest, a prophet because he represents God to people and a priest because he represents people to God. And so in other words, as a prophet, he spoke God's word to people. And as a priest, he spoke to God on behalf of other people. 
He was a member of the great synagogue, a group of 120 ruling elders of the nation. So not only was he a prophet and a priest, but he was also a very important person. So just imagine Joey Lee. And he was born in Babylon when God's people, the Israelites, were displaced from their home, but was one of the first to return back to Jerusalem. Now, Zechariah is a contemporary of Haggai, and he began prophesying shortly after him. He and Haggai were the two who challenged God's people to turn back to God and also carry out this great initiative of rebuilding the temple a place that represented God's dwelling place. And if Haggai was the one that God used to start a revival, then Zechariah was the one used by God to sustain that revival. Now, Zechariah's name means the Lord remembers. The Lord remembers. And this is so fitting because throughout this book, you see that God clearly remembers his people. He didn't forget about the Israelites when they were exiled into Babylon. Instead, he remembered them and brought them back into Jerusalem. He never forgot or gave up on them. And this book of Zechariah has 14 chapters, and they can be broken up into two parts. Chapters 1 through 8, which were written in about 520 B.C., and chapters 9 to 14, written about 470 B.C., And today, we'll be going through chapters 1 through 8. But important note, I want to challenge you to actually read through these first eight chapters of Zechariah this week. See, this message will only give a cursory view of these passages. And we're covering eight chapters in about 30 minutes and this is something that God has reminded me of me, uh, reminded me of recently, which is how important it is for his people to be in his word daily. I mean, just think about your eating habits. If you had one meal to eat each week on Sunday morning, just think about how hungry you'd be by the time you ate. You'd be starving. You'd be unhealthy and physically weak. But now... Imagine if you had a steady amount of good food going into your body. You'd be strong and healthy like Hidemi. Amen? Amen. Right? Hidemi, can you, can you just stand in front of the camera? Can you flex a little bit? Well, I don't know if you guys can see Hidemi, but out of this room right here, she has the biggest biceps and also the most toned abs. I'm telling you guys. See, but just imagine that, right? If you had a steady stream of good food going into your system, then you could be like my work mom, Hidemi. And that's what God has called all of us to, to be in his word on a daily basis. And so I want to challenge you that this week you would read through Zechariah, the first eight chapters, but also I want to challenge you that after this, each and every day, You would start your day in God's word and find your spiritual sustenance there. But today, we're talking about legacy. In other words, we're talking about our life's impact. And we're learning this from the book of Zechariah. And there are four key truths, four important key truths that we need to hold on to if we want to leave a legacy that reflects God to our world. And so today, we're going to go pretty quickly through the first eight chapters of Zechariah. And we've got these four key points about legacy. And so here we go. Point number one, learn from the mistakes of those before us. Learn from the mistakes of those before us. Would you actually look at someone next to you and say, learn? And look at someone else and say, learn. See, here's the thing about learning. Now, smart people will learn from their own mistakes, but wise people will learn from the mistakes of others. See, we naturally learn by making mistakes, and that's a part of life. You do something wrong, you experience repercussions, and if you're smart, you change course. But if you are wise, you look at the mistakes of others, you see the repercussions, and you change course. So if you want to be wise, learn from the mistakes of other people. Amen? 
Now, here is a question to you. What legacy was handed down to you? What legacy was handed down to you? In other words, how did the lives of those before you influence you? See, I heard this inspiring story from one of our college students. And he told me that one thing he always sees in the morning is his mom and dad reading the Bible. No matter the season of life or busyness of the times, his parents are always in God's word first thing in the morning. Also this, his dad constantly goes throughout the house checking up on his kids to make sure they're doing okay. And I don't know if this or, or maybe the next part is more amazing, but I'm not sure if it was him or another one of his siblings actually said that in the past few years, they haven't once seen their dad get mad. Think about that. Now, this is the kind of legacy that is being handed down to this college student, and it's being handed down to him by Pastor Stephen and Helen. And so that's the kind of legacy that their children are experiencing. So I just want to brag on our pastor and his wife, But just think about that, right? And think about your own family. Think about the legacy that was handed down to you. Did your family show you how to love or how to passionately follow Jesus? Or or maybe they taught you anger, bitterness, and brokenness. Or maybe it was a mix of both. Or think about your friend groups. Did they show you love, reliability, and lives devoted to Jesus? Or did they break your trust and cause you pain? See, when we think about the legacy that has been handed down to us, we can think of both positive and negative examples. But right now, I actually want to focus on the latter. I want us to think about all the mistakes that have been handed down to us and even the mistakes that we've seen throughout history. And so right now, uh, on this side of me, we have a bunch of examples of mistakes that have been made throughout history. And I'm going to start right here. This is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now, this took actually nearly 200 years to build and only 10 years to start leaning like this. Next, this is the Titanic. Now, this was known as the unsinkable ship. They didn't even have enough lifeboats because passengers um, who went on, they... They believed that they would have enough confidence in this boat, that this boat was just unsinkable, so they didn't need to have lifeboats to carry all the passengers. And sadly enough, this ship actually hit an iceberg, and it ended up sinking and taking with it many of its passengers. Here's another one. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this face, but um, this individual, his name is actually Stephen Thomas. Now, Stephen Thomas is actually famous in the cryptocurrency world, but for all the wrong reasons. Now, you might have heard this, but he's the one who only has two guesses left to input the right password that would unlock 7,002 Bitcoin. Why? Because he lost the paper that he wrote his password on. And so those 7,002 Bitcoin are now worth, listen to this, $250 million. That's almost as much Bitcoin as Kyongo has. Almost. But $250 million worth of Bitcoin And he only has two guesses left to to recover all of that wealth. You know, maybe we've seen this in individuals. 
um, who, who got married, had families. Uh, but these families, they, they broke up apart because of infidelity, hurts, or an inability to resolve conflict. Or lastly, maybe we've seen this in others who've lived life to an old age, but their lives were devoted to all the wrong things and devoid of purpose, that they lived for themselves, their pursuits, their dreams, their ambitions, instead of the purpose that God had designed for them. See, these are the mistakes that we need to learn from. And and Scripture actually makes the same point. You see, Zechariah 1, 1 through 6, it says this. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the Persian king, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berkeah, son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? You see, this group had passed away in exile as a consequence of their sins. And the prophets, do they live forever? Even these prophets who represented God eventually passed away. But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, Did they not overtake your fathers? Meaning, did God's words not come to fruition? So they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out, Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. And they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. You see, God was warning the Israelites not to be like their fathers or their ancestors. They had been told to turn away from sin and turn towards God. But these ancestors instead, they turned away from God and towards sin. And even though God sent prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel to lead them back to God, they actually refused. These are also, there are also mistakes or sins that those before us have made. And it is so important that we glean from them. They may have lost sight of God, not hearing him or or paying attention to him. We see we are called to be different. And so again, we need to learn from the mistakes of those before us. Point two is this. Look to the hope that God offers us. So look at someone next to you and say, look. Look and see that there is hope that God offers. You see, the Israelites, they were dejected. They had been taken away from their homelands into a place that was completely different. And it seems like forever. It wasn't just a day or months, but it lasted more than any of them had hoped. And everything that they had known was taken away from them. And they wondered if life would ever go back to the way it was. See, it kind of sounds like our COVID experience, doesn't it? Right, but, but now they have returned to their land and they are rebuilding the temple. And it's at this moment that God offers hope. And what I love about God is that he always offers hope. You see, that's the one thing that Christians have received. It's a living hope. And you see, hope isn't this manufactured sense of positivity. No, it's a belief. 
that's grounded in the truth that no matter the circumstances in our lives, that God is still here. God is still good, and God will still work all things for the good of those who love him. That through faith in Jesus, that even sin and death have lost their sting. And so God offers hope to us today as well as to the Israelites of the past. And in Zechariah chapters 1, verse 7, until the end of chapter 6, he offers hope through visions. There's actually eight visions that are given to Zechariah, and they include horsemen and horns and priests and flying scrolls. And, and what do all of these mean? Well, you can go ahead and write this down, because I think this will help you later on. And you can refer to this as you're reading through these verses. But this passage where we see these eight visions, they fall into a category of scripture that's called apocalyptic literature. And these passages actually predict the future using symbols and imagery. And when they do this, they usually are making a singular point. And they're kind of similar to the parables that Jesus would tell where he would make a simple point using a story like a mustard seed to describe the growth of God's kingdom or a lost sheep to describe God's pursuing character. So it's important that when reading through these, we don't try to draw meaning from every single detail of these visions, but instead we allow these visions to interpret themselves, which usually means there's one main point. But here's what we glean from these eight visions. See, God promises something in every single one of them. He promises prosperity, protection, his presence, forgiveness, restoration, cleansing, renewal, and rest. You see, God promises eight things through eight visions to restore hope to his people. And it's through this hope that the Israelites can look forward to a future that is better. And here's the third point that we glean from Zechariah. We need to live in obedience to the commands that God gives us. We need to obey. So look at the person next to you and say, obey. And look at someone else and say, O-B-E-Y, obey. Now, let me pause for a moment and, and speak to those who actually would not call themselves Christians, but are seeking out questions to their faith. See, whenever there is this call to obey, it can seem like Christianity is all about rules and regulations. And I hope you see that really at its core, it's about relationship. You see, Jesus, whom we follow, says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. The reason for obedience is a loving relationship with God. See, it's because God has shown us love that we want to... Oh, I don't know why that just came out of my throat. <laughs> <laughs> it's because God has shown us, I, I'm just, I'm passionate. <laughs> I don't think that was the Holy Ghost, but thanks, Pastor Tom. <laughs> it's because God has shown us love that we want to respond in obedience. And as we respond in obedience, we are expressing our love to him. But now, believers, it's crucial that we live in obedience to the commands that God gives to us. See, we see this in Zechariah 7. The temple is near its completion, and a group comes up to Jerusalem from Bethel, a city about 12 miles north of Jerusalem. And they ask this question, do we still have to fast in response to the temple's destruction 70 years ago? In other words, do they still need to keep this religious activity of refraining from food as they mourned what happened decades ago? Here's what Zechariah 7, 1 through 3 says. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Kislev. That means that this is about December 7th, 518 B.C., 
two years after the earlier eight visions and two years before the temple was completed. Now, the people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regam Melech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, should I weep and abstain, talking about food, in the fifth month as I have done for so many years. And so they're asking if they still need to mourn and fast to commemorate the time when the temple was destroyed. And then God answers them with one question and one command. He responds both with a probing question and also a command. And here's the question. We actually find this in verse 5. Here's what he says. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Say to all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh month, for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? See, God is asking if they had the right motives when they fasted because they did all of these external religious things. But God was asking if this was done for them, for him. When we talk about obedience in our lives today, we can't just talk about the things that we do because we can give to the poor We can care for the marginalized. We can attend Sunday service, lead a small group, give to church causes, and still actually be disobedient. Because obedience is a wholehearted obedience where it's not just about our actions, but it's our motivations that they would be focused on God, that it's about the heart. It's the reason for what we do. See, I can't tell you how many times I've done religious things in the name of God, but I lose sight of God while doing it. That after sermons, I can just think about my performance, how well I spoke, whether I was clear enough, or if I made the kind of impact I was trying to make. And I forget to go back to God and ask him to reveal his heart to me. Did I honor him? Was my posture right? Did I pray enough? Did I preach out of love and humility? Or was it all about me? I think about all the church activities I planned where I left wondering about people and what they thought instead of God and what he thought. Was it for me that you fasted? This is a question that I believe God is asking all of us today. Is it for him that we do all these things? Is it because our our hearts are so filled with his grace that we come out to serve food to our neighbors? Is it because we know how amazing the love of God is that we serve our small groups? Is it because we truly believe that the gospel is good news, that we foster community at work so we can share Jesus with our coworkers? Do we leave Sunday services asking ourselves, was God pleased with my worship today? Because that is my one goal. You see, these are the questions we need to ask ourselves because they reveal our motives. And then the second part, of God's response to their question about fasting, it continues on with a command. The word of God says this, and the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, meaning think rightly from God's perspective, show kindness and mercy to one another, meaning have the right relationships, Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, meaning show compassion to the marginalized. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart, meaning have the right motivation. In other words, learn to think the right way in your relationships and live that out. Because God cares about righteous living more than religious rituals. And any kind of religious activity that we do simply for the sake of doing does not please God. But when one lives a life that is centered on him, that pleases God. 
And so to sum up this third point, what is more important than our fasting is actually our obedience. A wholehearted obedience that begins with our heart and influences our hands. And it's this very obedience that allows us to leave a spiritual legacy. Which leads us to our fourth and final point. Zechariah teaches us to leave a spiritual legacy for those after us. Now, because we did it for the other three, and I don't want this fourth point to feel jealous, look at someone next to you and say, leave. (laughs) Now, with all sincerity, look at someone else and just say, leave. (laughs) See, we may come from a legacy of mistakes, failures, shortcomings, and sins, but if we look to God for hope and we live obediently, then we can leave a spiritual legacy. Zechariah 8, 11 through 13, in that God declares that Israel would become a blessing to others. He says this, but now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as in the former days, declares the Lord of hosts. For there shall be a sowing of peace. The vine shall give its fruit and the ground shall give its produce. And the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of his people to possess all these things. And as you have been a byword of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing Fear not, but let your hands be strong. You shall be a blessing. This group would leave a spiritual impact, an eternal impact on those around them. And so here's a question for us. What legacy will we leave? See, what kind of impact will our community have? Not just one of us but all of us as a whole, because I think we too often individualize our faith when throughout Scripture, God sees his people as a collective group. According to Barna, a Christian market research firm, one in three practicing Christians stopped attending church services during COVID. See, but but this is just a snapshot of a bigger trend. People are leaving the church. And in younger generations, it's even more pronounced. See, now here is the next question. If this is the trend in our world, what are we doing about it? What is our New Story community doing to leave an impact on the next generations? I recently had a chance to spend some time with a college student, and he ended up sharing a story with me and also several others. And he shared that he had attended church growing up into high school, and he stopped attending in college. See, he had struggles with the church, and this made him hesitant to return. But one day, a friend invited him to attend a new story service, and so he came. And from that day forward, our church members began pouring out love and acceptance on him. Eventually, he got plugged into a small group where he began deepening in his faith journey with his leader and fellow peers. And at one point, after this community had invested in him, he began to realize that God is real. And according to his words, if it weren't for New Story, he wouldn't consider himself a Christian today. You see, it was our community coming alongside someone who had been scarred by religious people that left an eternal impact on his life. And so New Story Church, let me ask all of us, what kind of legacy Will our community leave? Is our legacy going to be us doing a lot of religious activity but losing sight of God's heart? 
Or will we leave a legacy of love, selflessness, and grace where others notice a different kind of culture, a Holy Spirit-empowered culture where people love deeply, forgive unconditional, sacrifice selflessly, give generously, abide in Jesus constantly, pray unceasingly, share Scripture passionately, and reflect Jesus clearly because that is the legacy that God wants us to leave. Can I get an amen? You see, New Story Church, that is spiritual legacy. And everything that we do is all for that. For that one person to come to know Jesus in a real way. That our scholarships, our food pantry, our service opportunities, etc. That all of these things are just means through which we can reflect God's light and love to our world because we want to leave a spiritual legacy and we want to continue to engage creatively with the communities around us so we can accomplish that. Now, we're, we're going to enter into a time of giving our tithes and our offerings. And before we do, I want to remind this group See, we, we glanced, just glanced at the first eight chapters of Zechariah. But this week, would you spend time digging deeper into these texts and encountering God through them? Now, if you want to give not out of obligation because we talked about that earlier, but from a grateful and cheerful heart that is overflowing with God's love. And you want to support this vision of reaching more in Los Angeles with the love of Jesus. You can do so through all the instructions that show up on the screen. And the easiest way to do this is just to point your camera at the QR code. But right now, we're going to respond in worship. We're going to turn our hearts and our voices to God. And so right now, let's continue on in our time of worship. Thank you for listening. If you are inspired by this message, make sure you subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. We hope you'll tune in again soon.